بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Continuing with our journey through the series that we do every Thursdays, the heaviest of deeds pertaining to good manners and characteristics which are pleasing to Allah Azawajal in Islam. So today's topic is pertaining to mannerisms and etiquettes of brotherhood in Islam. So we know and we understand that if somebody has a brother in Islam, then this is truly a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm talking here about a brother, of course, in the deen. A brother who will stand with you and help you to journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one of the greatest blessings that a person can have. And we'll come to know this more and more as we go through the points in the lecture, inshallah. So what are the mannerisms and the points that we need to consider pertaining to this great topic and this lofty topic of brotherhood in Islam? The first of them is that we have to ensure that we are careful with regards to who we take as a companion. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, That those people who were close in the dunya, they used to spend lots of time with each other. They had lots of emotion for each other. That on that day, on the day of judgment, there will be enemies one to another, except for those who are of piety, except for those who are of muttaqin, those who are ahlu taqwa. So you have to be extremely careful who you choose as a companion, because you don't want to be in that situation that you find yourself on the day of judgment, not being rewarded for your companionship, but rather being taken into account for having chosen the wrong companion. And why is this? The Prophet ﷺ, as narrated or collected by Imam Ahmad in Tirmidhi, he said, a rajulu ala dini ahadukum man That a person is going to reflect the religion of his companion, of his friend. So be very careful who you take as a companion. This is the reality in any time or society or place that you live. Peer pressure and social pressure. You are a reflection of the people that you choose to mix with and that's why the management gurus they tell you that if you want to succeed in your projects if you want to succeed in your business if you want to succeed in your professional life be around those who are known to be successful because they will rub off on you rub off on you in terms of their habits and in terms of the way they behave and think and likewise in every other sphere of society in other every other sphere of life people rub off on us whether we Intend to let them or not intend to let them. So whatever they do, we end up doing some of it. The way they think, we end up thinking in that way. What they like, we end up liking. So the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us that it's extremely important that when you take a brother or a sister in Islam, you're very selective in who you take. It has to be somebody who's going to bring benefit to you. And we're not talking about the worldly benefits. Because the worldly benefits are in reality easy to come by. We are talking about the ukhrawi benefits, that which comes in the hereafter, and that is hard to come by. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Ahmad and Tirmidhi, لا تصاحب إلا مؤمنا ولا يأكل طعامك إلا التقي That do not take as a companion except for the one who has iman, the mu'min. And do not allow to eat your food except for the one who is taqi. The person of taqwa. So again, the Prophet ﷺ is drilling that message home. Be very careful who you take as companions. And you see in the first part of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not be a companion except to the one who is a mu'min, the one who has belief, iman. And in the second part, he mentioned instead of man, he mentioned taqwa. So why did the Prophet ﷺ make this tafriq between these two words? That do not have it as a companion except the believer, and do not allow to eat your food except the one who has taqwa. So some of the ulama, they said that this is min bab tanwi' that this is the Prophet ﷺ using interesting speech and not making his speech boring. That the Prophet ﷺ, he would choose different words which have slightly different meanings or could be used for the same meaning. That's why he used here mu'min and then he used here taqi, the one who has taqwa. Others, they said no. It means that when you have companionship, for sure you should choose people for Iman. But those who are going to be invited to your house, not invited, those who are going to eat with you as really close companions, 
those who spend really close time with you, and those who get to come to your house and spend special moments with you, they are the ones that you have really have to be selectful. So not just that, do they have to be mu'min, they should be muttaqeen, the higher level, they should be people of taqwa. This is from what Dr. Abd Aziz Al-Fawzan, Hafidhullah, he mentioned. In Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kahamil al misk wa nafiq al keel. That the likeness or the similitude of the good companion that you sit with and the evil companion is the likeness of the one who is a perfume seller or the one who blows with met metal and iron into the fire. Nafiq al keel. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fahamil al misk, imma yuhdiyaka. Either he's going to gift you some perfume, so you're going to smell very nice with the perfume he's gifted you. Or you're going to purchase from him some perfume. Or you're going to find from him a nice smell. So the Prophet ﷺ is establishing the likeness of a good person, a good companion, is like the one who sells perfume. There's no way you lose out with that person. Either you benefit from him as a gift, he gives you perfume, so you smell good. Either you're going to buy something from him, so you smell good. Either you're going to go away taking some of the smell and the aroma which is surrounding him in his shop or in his gathering. So this person, the good companion, is the one you want to be with. And then he said, And the one who deals with the fire blowing into the fire, this person, either he's going to burn your clothes or you're going to find from him a very filthy smell, a very dirty smell because of the type of work and the environment that he has put himself in. Likewise, the evil person. Whenever you mix with an evil person, one way or the other, he's going to either burn your clothes, which means burning your good deeds, or you're going to find from him a bad smell, which is bad effect. And you will end up following that person in their ways. So it's extremely important to choose the best of friends, the best of companions for brotherhood. What else is extremely important for mannerisms? is that when you have this brother in Islam, you should love him for the sake of Allah, not loving him for the sake of the world. The sister should love her sister for the sake of Allah, seeking Allah's pleasure, not seeking something in the dunya. I don't get to know somebody because I know he can help me get a good job, because I know he can help me get more friends maybe, more social media likes. It's not about that. It's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liking you. That's why in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, Inna Allah ta'ala yaqul yawm al qiyamah That verily Allah will say on the Day of Judgment, Aina al mutahabuna bi jalali, al yawma adhilluhum fi dhilli, yawma la dhill illa dhilli. Where are those, Allah will exclaim on the Day of Judgment, proclaim, sorry, where are those that used to love each other for my sake? Today I will shade them in shade, my shade, when there is no other shade except for this shade. So it's a special status given to those who came together and parted for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith, it mentioned that there's a shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean? What does it mean, the shade of Allah azawajal? It's to do with the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This shade, Allah azawajal, it will be under the throne for a special group of believers, protected from the scorching sun on that day, which will be torturing people. So this shade, where did it come from? How do you normally have a shade in the dunya? Normally there is light above the object, right? And then from that emanates the shade, that the light is shine, shines onto the object and you find shade. Is there something above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can anything be above Allah azawajal? He is the most high. There's nothing higher than Allah azawajal. So this shade is a shade which was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not due to something being above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is an important point of aqeedah belief that Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned when explaining this hadith in the other salihin. Imam Ahmad, he collects, and Imam Ibn Abdul Bar in the Tamheed, he said it's authentic that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah will say on the day of judgment, wajabat mahabbati lil mutahabina fiya, wal mutajalisina fiya, wal mutazawirina fiya, wal mutabadirina fiya. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say on the day of judgment, my love has become incumbent, obligatory upon those who visited one another for my sake. 
upon those who loved one another for my sake, upon those who sat together with one another for my sake, upon those who spent upon each other for my sake. So they would come together in the masjids trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would remind each other that, oh, so-and-so, there is a lecture at so-and-so place. Let's go. Leave alone your PlayStation. Leave alone the TV. Leave alone what you're doing. Spend some time with me. Let's go and do a good deed. There were those who would come together to think of good projects that they can do for the sake of the ummah, for the sake of the deen, for the sake of the community. They were those who would always remind each other with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to, who would visit each other for his sake, love each other for his sake, spend upon each other for his sake. So it's imperative that when you have this companionship with a Muslim, that you make it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you find that you love somebody for the sake of Allah, what should you say? Alhamdulillah, of course, because this is a blessing from Allah Azawajal. Very good. What else should you say? Allah. I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to one of the companions who said, I love such and such. He said, did you tell him? You should tell the person that you love him for the sake of Allah. If you truly find that in your heart. Okay? And the person will say, Allah fi. May Allah love you for whose sake you have loved me. Right? So loving each other should be told and it's a cause for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the mannerisms that one should have in this brotherhood, this gift of brotherhood, is that they should always find themselves smiling to their brothers. They shouldn't be of that person who's frowning. When his brother comes to see him and meet him, he's frowning. What's that going to do to the brotherhood? It's going to cause separation. It's going to cause difficulty for them to get along. Even though the person may not have intended anything in his heart towards the person coming to greet him. But if you're not of a countenance face, of a smiling bright face to the person, then the person won't feel that love and that brotherhood that is supposed to be there. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Muslim, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا ولو أن تلقى أخاق بوجه طلق the Prophet ﷺ said, do not look down upon any good deed. Meaning, do not think to yourself, this good deed is too small for me to do or to appreciate. The Prophet ﷺ said, even if it means that you meet your brother in Islam with a smiling face. So meeting your brother with Islam in a smi with a smiling face is from the good deeds. What did the Prophet ﷺ elsewhere equate, equal the smiling face to? Charity, Ahsan. The Prophet said in the hadith in Tirmidhi, that you smile in the face of your brother, for you is a good deed of charity. So just by smiling at the people, and some people are gifted with this, they have a very beautiful and easy smile. Others like myself, we have to struggle a bit. So some people who have the easy smile, spread it. There's so much reward for you. It's so easy for you to gain those rewards. Meet the people, greet the people, smile at them. For the sake of Allah Azawajal. So the brotherhood, there should be lots of smiling and the person should try his best not to be from those who frowns when people come to give him salam. Also in this brotherhood and this intermingling of the believers is that the believer, he should try to be an easygoing person. Meaning that he doesn't like to make things difficult for other people. He's not uptight. He's not somebody that when you ask him for something or when you try to discuss something with him, he tries to put you down or make life difficult for you. No, he's always making things easy for you. You always find that whenever you go to that person, the door is open as much as possible. He's there to help if he can. Ahmed, Radhi, Ahmed Rahimullah Ta'ala, Imam Ahmed, he collects the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu said, forbidden upon the hellfire is every easygoing, flexible, easy to deal with and sociable person. That if the person can embody these type of characteristics in the brotherhood, then the hellfire is far away for him. Then he won't be from those who are exposed to the hellfire. Because he has so many good deeds. Every time people are coming near him, they're benefiting. Even if he's not giving them something materialistically, he's uplifting them emotionally. And you know that is one of the biggest things that people need as a human being. Many a time we forget empathy, compassion. This is what people need, human beings. This is a real need for people. Sometimes you have nothing to give somebody, but for you to spend that moment listening to their complaint or listening to their difficulty, that in itself is a cure for that person. That you've allowed that person to remove what's difficult in his chest to another person. You've uplifted that person, right? 
So it's imperative that you be an easygoing person. But this easygoingness, it shouldn't be mutlaq, it shouldn't be free and open. It has to be within the confines of the Sharia. And the reason I mention this is because some people, when they have brotherhood, they cover each other's mistakes all of the time. Meaning that this person, he's one of my close brothers, so I'm never going to really tell him off for doing the wrong that he's doing. No, it has to be within the confines of the Sharia. We are always enjoying the good and forbidding the evil upon each other, but with manners, with compassion and love. So we don't become from those persons who, because we're a group of brothers, we consider ourselves special. We stop advising each other. We start, in fact, lying about each other to other people. That a person wants to come and marry this brother. I know that this brother has huge issues with women. So I have to be honest and tell the people that, no, don't marry this brother because X, Y, and Z. He's known to beat women. But because he's close to me, I may be from those who cover that up. And that's absolutely wrong. We shouldn't become like a clique that we, over, we start to overlook things for the sake of pleasing each other instead of for the sake of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brotherhood is all, always predicated on the pleasure of Allah azawajal, first and foremost. From brotherhood and the mannerisms which are so important that we have to be from those who are always willing to give nasiha. The Prophet sallallahu said in Sahih Muslim, Inna deena nasiha, that verily the religion is nasiha. So this type of phrase when the Prophet sallallahu uses it, it's like showing so much importance to this aspect. Where the Prophet sallallahu said, um, Al-Hajju Arafa. The Prophet ﷺ said that Hajj, the reality of Hajj, or the most important pillar, is Arafah. That whoever misses Arafah, then he misses out on Hajj. Likewise here, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ad-Deenu Nasiha. The reality of the Deen, or the fundamental core aspects of the Deen, is Nasiha. They said, Liman Ya Rasulullah. To who, O Prophet of Allah, should this Nasiha be? He said, Lillahi wa li, ras- li-, wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi. He said it should be to Allah, to his book, to his prophet, to the leaders of the Muslims, and to the common folk. And this is the part that concerns us, to the common folk, meaning your brothers in Islam and those who are with you in the community in Islam, that you should have nasiha towards them. And nasiha has the meanings of sincerity and wishing goodness for people. So whoever you meet as a Muslim, it cannot be in your heart that you will ever, ever wish any harm for this believer. It just cannot happen if you have Iman. If your Iman is sound, you can never meet a brother Muslim and wish for him harm, wish for him evil, or refrain from giving him nasiha, giving him sincere advice in a loving way, hoping for him to improve himself, not keeping things away from him which will benefit him. Don't be from those people who think that Allah's treasure is limited. Sometimes people, they come across a bounty and they benefit from it, but they don't want to tell the other people because they feel that maybe I will lose this bounty. No, the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are unlimited. So when you come across bounties, when you have the ability to advise people to good and to improve their situation, part of brotherhood is that you give the nasiha, that you will do so because you want people to improve around you. Also, extremely important from the mannerisms of brotherhood in Islam is that there has to be mutual cooperation. Ala birri wa taqwa, Allah says, and help one another in doing that which is good and from piety. Ala ithmi wal udwan. And do not help one another to, that, to do that which is sinful or transgression. The Prophet وسلم, when he came to Medina and he was going to establish a masjid, there was a lot of building to do. A lot of digging. Did the Prophet ﷺ sit on the sides and watch? Or was the Prophet ﷺ deep there in the trenches digging with the believers? He was there lifting the stones. He was there experiencing what the believers were experiencing. Meaning that he was there fully showing how to have mutual cooperation. It's not like today many of us, it's okay, it's so easy to give the lecture. It's so easy to give the words of advice. But to actually get down and do what the people need to actually help them physically or emotionally or financially, that is the real difficult test and the real difficult work. So the brother, the Muslim brother or the Muslim sister, the believers, they have mutual cooperation wherever they are able to do so. Whatever they can do for one another, they will do so. The Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari, Al-Mu'min lil-Mu'min kal-Bunyan yashuddu ba'duhum ba'da wa shabaka bayna asabi'ihi The Prophet ﷺ 
He said the likeness of the believer one to another is like a building. Okay? It supports one another. They support one another like the bricks support one another in a building. And then the Prophet ﷺ joined between his fingers like so, showing how tight and how close the believers are in mutual cooperation. And as we said, this is a sign of Iman. It cannot be the case that you want harm for anybody as a believer. Your Muslim brother, you only look upon him and hope that he receives good like you are receiving good. The scholars, they also mention that in this journey of brotherhood or to experience this bounty of brotherhood and to make it even more enjoyable is that we have to be humble with one another. And this is something which is very difficult for people. Humble means that we don't look down upon one another thinking that this person, he's from a different nationality, he's lower than me. I'm Pakistani, he's Indian, so he's lower than me. He's Indian, I'm African, so he's lower than me. Doesn't matter what your nationality is. Doesn't matter what your economic status is. I'm a doctor, he's just a poor cleaner, right? He's just a hafid al-Quran. I'm a pilot. We don't have these thoughts in the brotherhood of Islam. We look upon one another through the lenses of being humble with one another. The Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ أَوْحَىٰ أَن تَوَاضَعُوا حَتَّىٰ لَا The Prophet ﷺ said that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to me that you should force yourselves and cause yourselves to be humble with one another to the extent that none of you will look down upon the other, nor will you ever transgress upon the rights of the other. SubhanAllah, can you imagine the situation of our communities and our countries if we were to be able to establish this one teaching that the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us, that just be humble. You were created from the same drop of liquid that the other person was created from. You have the same Lord that this person has, the same Creator Allah. You're going to end up in the same turab, the same soil that this person is going to end up in. Why are you looking down upon one another? Why is there enmity towards one another? Take it easy. Have humility and humbleness with one another. Never allow yourself to become arrogant. If, when you ever do a good deed, whether it's learning Quran, whether it's here teaching, whether it's on the mimbar, or it's the case that ever you have something, you have a pay rise, a new promotion, you became the director of the company. If you ever find in your heart that that leads you to looking down upon the people, then know that you have to be extremely careful. This may not be a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you. This may be a trial or a punishment. So you have to be extremely careful not to fall into that situation of being arrogant and looking down upon the people. The Prophet sallallahu told us, or the Prophet sallallahu showed us through his actions, that for brotherhood and for living in society, whether it's with our families or outside of our families, that we always have to beg Allah for good character. The Prophet ﷺ would ask Allah, Allah mahdini li ahsani akhlaq, la yahdi li ahsani ha illa ant, wasrif anni sayyiaha, la yasrifu anni sayyiaha illa ant. Oh Allah, guide me to the best of character. This is the Prophet ﷺ saying this. None can guide to the best of character except you, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, take away from me evil character. None can take that away from me except for you, O oh Allah. So why, why do we need to beg for good character apart from the obvious, which is that we have bad character? Why is it so important to have good character? Because the more you have good character, the more the people around you will benefit. The more your family members will benefit. The happier your wife will be. The happier your parents will be. The happier your brothers and sisters in Islam will be. If we have good character. Everything that I'm talking about emanates from Iman and emanates from good character. So we have to beg Allah continually for this good character. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us where he said, Al Muslim, man salim al Muslimun min lisanihi wa yadihi. That the believer, the Muslim, is the one who protects those around him from the harm of his tongue or his hand. So as we said a few moments ago, the believer can never harm or intentionally want to harm those believers that are around him. It cannot be the case. If he has belief and iman, yes, we'll make mistakes. Yes, we will trip up. Yes, we will fall from time to time from the path of iman. But it shouldn't be that it's who we are as a person, that it's part of our character that we like to see people suffering or we like to see people in a bad situation. That can never be the case. What is extremely important also from having brotherhood 
or establishing brotherhood, the mannerisms, is that we have to have good opinion of one another. We shouldn't be suspicious of one another. We shouldn't be looking down upon one another. We shouldn't be spying upon one another. We shouldn't take when someone said something or does something immediately as the possible worst outcome, the possible worst thought that he said this because he meant this in an evil way. He did that because he meant something evil by it. No, the believer is the opposite to that. The believer tries to good, to give a good assumption to the words of his brother, a good assumption to the word to the actions of his brother, because Allah says in the Quran, "Istanibu kathira min al-zan, inna ba'd al-zan ithm, wa la tajassu, wa la yaktab ba'dukum ba'da." The Prophet Allah said in the Quran, Surah Al-Hujurat, "Avoid much of suspicion, Be- avoid much of suspicion, because some of suspicion is evil, it's a sin." And do not backbite one another. And before that, he said, and do not spy upon one another. So these things, the uh, having evil suspicion of one another, the spying of one another, the backbiting of one another, they have to be avoided. Because again, as we keep saying, it doesn't fit in with having iman, and it doesn't fit in with having good character, and it doesn't fit in with the claim that you are a brother to the brothers of Islam, and that you are a sister to the sisters of Islam. Brothers and sisters, they cannot behave in this manner with one another. However, <clears throat> there are at times when you will find people in the communities that are spreading mischief, right? Whether that is mischief in deeds or whether that is mischief in belief. So these people, they are not left alone. They are to be spoken about because if we do not speak about their evil, their evil will spread because they are out there openly spreading that evil. If we do not stop the evil that they are doing, the evil will spread. However, who is the person that will deal with this? Is it me? Is it you? As soon as we see somebody doing something wrong, we think, yeah, now I have to go into uh, you know, Facebook and write about this person. We have to send out the WhatsApp messages about this person. Who is the one responsible for this? It's the community leaders. And before them, it's the scholars. Because they have the knowledge, they have the experience. First and foremost, they will determine, <coughs> excuse me, is this person doing something which is contrary to the teachings of Islam? Because many a time we think somebody is doing something wrong, but they're not doing wrong. It's just that our knowledge was limited. Our awareness of that situation was limited. But the scholar, he will have more knowledge and he will be able to understand. The community leaders, they will have more wisdom and they will know how to deal with that situation. So it's upon them to rectify the people of the community, not people who have no knowledge and no experience in doing such and such, because they will cause more harm then they cause good also what is extremely beautiful and important from the mannerisms of brotherhood is that we forgive one another brothers and sisters husbands and wives anybody in a close relationship any relationship is bound to come apart at times even if it's momentarily there are very few people blessed on this earth that do not ever have arguments or do not ever disagree with one another but they do exist. May Allah bless them. But the majority of us, we're going to have an argument from time to time. We're going to misjudge a situation from time to time. We're going to misspeak from time to time. Right? So what does Allah teach us? He says, And those who are able to control their anger, and those who are able to forgive others, Allah called them that Allah loves those who are muhsin those who have goodness in them at a high level, people of Ihsan. So this is something that Allah encourages us to do. Wherever you can, you overlook. Wherever you can, you think, the brother, he didn't mean to speak to me like that. The brother did that, maybe I don't know the background to the situation. I'm going to overlook it. And by you overlooking it, you're going to have a happier life. Because if you're from those people that keeps the negative thoughts in you, or keeps the negative feelings in you, they're harming nobody but you. Everybody else just carries on in life. It's you who's sitting there with those negative feelings. We have to let them go. We have to continue with a positive manner. Of course, this is in a situation where this person is not habitually known for harming people. If he's habitually known for harming people, then we have to deal with that person. But generally, brotherhood and sisterhood, when these mistakes occur, we overlook and we forgive because that is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet mentioned, that the gates of Jannah are opened 
يوم الاثنين تيوزداي and يوم الخميس يوم الاثنين Monday right and يوم الخميس Thursday فيغ فيغفر لكل عبد لا يشرك لا لا يشرك بالله شيئا so it's forgiven to every person who doesn't ascribe any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no type of shirk whether it's major or minor right all of those are forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on these days illa rajulan the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said except for a person kanat baynahu wa bayna akhihi shahna'u except for a person that had between him and his brother some type of enmity so when this forgiveness is taking place the one who had enmity between him and his brother Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them anziru hadaini hatta yastalihah Leave these two out of this forgiveness until they rectify what is between themselves. Leave them out of this forgiveness until they rectify what is between themselves. So you see how dangerous it is not to forgive people, not to be quick to mend relationships with people for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because we are missing out on the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet ﷺ told us. And also the Prophet ﷺ mentioned elsewhere in another hadith, I believe it's in Abi Dawood, that the Prophet ﷺ said, The Prophet ﷺ said, I guarantee a house in Jannah for the person who leaves alone an argument for the sake of Allah, even though he was right in that argument. He may have been upon the truth. He may have had the right to argue, but he left it alone to please Allah He realized that, what's the point? It's just words. We're getting back and forth with words. Let it go for the sake of Allah This person, he's guaranteed what? By the Prophet a house in Jannah. Because not easy to do, right? The majority of us in our personalities, we don't want to be the one who doesn't have the last word. We like to have the last word. We like to be the one who wins the argument. But if you're the one who can stop the argument for the sake of Allah then rewards are huge for you by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And following on from this, mentioned in Tirmidhi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Should I not inform you of a person who can gain more in reward from the one who is fasting or praying or giving sadaqah? Of course, this is not the obligatory sadaqah or prayer or fasting. This is the voluntary. So how can you gain more reward from the voluntary of the praying and the fasting and the charity which is voluntary. The Prophet ﷺ said, the one who reconciles between people. He finds people have differences between them. He finds that they have some type of argumentation. So he's quick to try and reconcile between them. He's quick to try and bring them back together to love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person, he has a huge reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the same hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that to cause friction between people is from that which takes away the iman of a person. In this context of bringing people together to uh, reunite the people upon the brotherhood, what is the sin that is not a sin in this context? It's normally a sin, but in this context it's not a sin. Ahsant, lying, al kadhab right? To lie in this situation is not a sin. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that the person... For example, you find two people, two brothers amongst your community, you've come to know that they stopped talking to one another for whatever reason. So you go to one of them and you say, you know, Brother Ahmed, he was mentioning you the other day in a beautiful way. And then you go to the other one, Brother Muhammad, and you say, you know what? Uh, to, you say to Ahmed, Muhammad mentioned you in a beautiful way. So you're telling a lie. They didn't mention that about each other. But your intention is to rectify the hearts. Because then Ahmed will phone Muhammad and Muhammad will phone Ahmed. Or next time they see each other, they will be happier with each other because they were told that they were being spoken about in a nice way by the other. So in this manner, you are allowed to lie to bring people together. So it shows you how important it is to have closeness as brotherhood because something which is normally a sin and despised by Allah, which is lying, where in the hadith the Prophet said the believer never lies. He may fall into other sins, but he will never lie. But it's exempted or is permitted in this situation of bringing people together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what I said today, I'll stop here inshallah. There's so much more to be mentioned in this topic of brotherhood because it's so important and it's so loved to Allah Azawajal as we came to know through the hadith that we mentioned about how Allah loves those who establish brotherhood for his sake. So I urge you all 
that you go away and when you have time, you read about this topic, you learn about this topic, and you look back to how were the Sahaba and those who came after them with regards to brotherhood. There's one narration with one of the Salaf, he came to his brother's house, not related brother, brother in Islam. He knocked on the door, the servant opened the door, the young girl. He said, where is such and such? Where is your master? She said, he's out. He said, show me where he keeps his money. Imagine, show me where he keeps his money. So he went to the money and he took from it, whatever he wanted, put it in his pocket and he left. He told the teller such and such came to see him. When the owner came back of the house, he was told that such and such came to visit you and this took place, he took from your money and I couldn't stop him. This man, he said, if what you're telling me is true, then you are free for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he was so happy and overwhelmed with joy that he had a brother in Islam that treated him like a true brother. That his brother had a need and he could come to his wealth and take from it whatever he wants. Now, I'm not saying to you, go ahead and do that in today's time. He will cause a big problem, right? But this is how the Salaf used to be. This is how the true righteous people are. And I met a person in my lifetime. Alhamdulillah, I had the pleasure of studying with him. He was a very poor person. He was in a situation where he didn't have much. He, couldn't, he found difficulty to, to even rent a room. So one time his brother needed money. He went out and took a loan for his brother and he ended up sleeping in a car for months to come. For months he was sleeping in a car because he couldn't spend money because he had taken out a loan to help his brother. He himself was probably in more need, but he did that deed for his brother. There are people like that. And we need to try to elevate ourselves a little bit towards that status if we can. And that can only come through reading about brotherhood and learning the virtues of brotherhood and reading the stories of those who established brotherhood before us in the best of ways. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward us immensely for this deed of attending this lecture. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to overlook any shortcomings and mistakes and to reward us from any good that was said and listened to. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa If you have any questions, then feel free. If not, then jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.